today, each and every one of you who showed up. Hey, how do you like our new uh, um, intro music? If you're watching live, is that I changed it up, so <laughs> <laughs> so we thought we'd uh, try that. I'll keep I'll keep on kind of like fiddling with it until we get it. But I thought a little more country, you know, in order to go with the Cowtown theme, <laughs> would be appropriate. So I'm glad you're here with us today, Janice. Thank you. You've had an eventful few weeks. Yes, yeah. I have. <laughs> yeah. How's your mom doing? My mom is doing unbelievably well, and I want to say thank you to everyone who's prayed for her because she, um, her diagnosis was pretty dire. Uh, she had uh, she had shingles so bad that the shingles virus actually went to her brain and affected her ability to move and to speak. And um, within one day, she started being able to move her arms and her legs, and she started to speak. But now, um, it's been about three weeks. She's actually speaking conversations um, and she's happy and her therapist told her she needs to slow down she's walking too fast um, you know all that kind of stuff but she's just um, doing really well I'll, I'll tell you just a, no. I've told so many people this but you know like my sister when she went w with her to the restroom and she's at her house and she told her you know mom every time you use the restroom you need to use this and she held up the soap and mom goes yes ice cream <laughs> so that's how my mom's brain works right now. It's like, it's kind of uh, like she entertains us all because you never know what's going to come out of her mouth. Yeah. But um, she's really trying hard. She said a long word the other day and she's like, she was in a conversation. She said a long word and then she stops and she goes, I just said a long word and I used it right. <laughs> so she was all proud of herself. Yeah, that's wonderful. Yeah. So that's good. Well, let's just go. I can just say a quick prayer for your mom and for Sue and, and, your brothers who are still there, and and that um, mm -hmm. we just ask God's blessing upon them, okay. and also on our service at, the, at this time. Uh, Father in heaven, we are grateful for your love and care in our lives. We're thankful for the progress that Carol has made uh, following this um, um, health crisis. We pray you continue to watch over her and be with uh, Sue and Gary and Tom and, and Janice as they um, uh, continue to support and and uh, love her and we just pray that you will um uh, be with her we know that she loves you lord and that that, uh, that you have been her life for um, all these years and we just ask that you continue to watch watch over her be with us today as we uh, talk about christ's resurrection and ways that that uh, will change our lives we ask this in jesus name amen so all right. Well, thank you for coming up, Janice, and being back with us. We're talking here today about three uh, ways that Christ's resurrection will change your life. I've already offered up the prayer. So let's just go ahead and we'll start with our little intro graphic and, and then get going with the service. Might need to adjust the volume here locally. So, all right. Um, so we've been going through these um, meal scenes in the Gospel of Luke, and we're finishing that up today. And so uh, we will just kind of wade into what we have um, here for us today. Three big ways that Christ's resurrection will change your life. And you know, I've been doing a lot of study on Christ's resurrection over the last few weeks. I'm working with a team of Christian apologists to develop a website uh, at um, minimalfacts.org. You know, if you think about, for instance, for a moment, like a, a court case, and in a court case, they have, uh, they have what's called discovery. And discovery means what evidence both the prosecution and the defense will be able to have access to uh, during the course of the trial, so no one gets ambushed during the course of the trial. Well, with respect to the resurrection, is that there is evidence that both Christian and non-Christian, uh, uh, secular historians, atheists and skeptics, that they all agree upon. And we'll talk about some of that evidence as we go through uh, a little bit today. And so it's by using those, those um, minimal facts, that's why we call it the minimal facts approach, is by using those minimal facts is that 
you can um, make an inference to the best explanation of, it's just like in a jury trial, you know, is that, um, that you present the evidence and then you make an inference to the best explanation. And of course the defense is always going to, uh, to posture the evidence one way and the prosecution is going to always po posture the evidence another way. And there'll be rebuttals back and forth and so on and so forth. And, and we're not gonna go, we're not gonna dive deep into that today. But what we will be doing is that I'll be, I, I'm developing a, um, a website uh, for that and including some animated stuff. I've, I've gotten on this animated uh, jag here lately, and, I, and maybe you even saw a little announcement I put out for the uh, service, been trying to um, incorporate animation into, and I think it's a whole lot easier to do it that way, or it's not easier by, by any stretch of the imagination, but I think it does allow people to stay engaged and interested in the, um, in the project. And so we, I'm going to be developing those as I go along the more I learn about this. It's just always something new for me. You know how that goes. I'm always um, trying to um, figure out new things along the way. But when you think about Christ's death and resurrection, it's, that it's really the most significant event in human history. Now, uh, and, and obviously people are going to um, uh, dispute that, but if what really happened on the cross really happened and that Jesus atoned for humanity's sins, he paid the penalty, the debt that we owe for our sins so that we can be reconciled with God. And, and, and while I believe that that's true and I think that we have good evidence to believe that that's the case, <clears throat> that uh, I'm just saying if for now, okay? And so if that that's what really happened on the cross and if that Jesus really did come back. He was not just mostly dead, like in Princess Bride, you know, is that he was dead as dead could be, and that through the miraculous power of God, that God uh, resurrected the body, the same exact body that was placed into the tomb is the same exact body that was resurrected and came out of the tomb. Now, obviously, that it had, it had new properties to it that it didn't have when it went into the tomb. And, We'll talk a little bit about that too. But if those two things are true, then, uh, then this is really the biggest event in human history. It's not inconsequential. It's not something that we can just relegate to the past and blow it off, is that this is really the most important thing that has ever happened in our world, ever, ever, ever. There's nothing that rivals that. And so the big question then remains is that, um, is that what will be the impact of this event on your life? You know, today we are celebrating the 4th of July, and I, I, I it's, uh, you know, what is, is it the second, what is today, is it the third? third. Yeah, okay, the third of July, tomorrow is the fourth. So everything just becomes a blur for me after a while. But, um, and, but what we do on this day and this holiday is that, you know, of course, a lot of people just use it as an excuse for a long weekend. But what we do on this holiday is that um, we celebrate an event that happened um, back in 1776. I think it's interesting, by the way, that we celebrate the Declaration of Independence, but we really don't celebrate Constitution Day. And that the reason why is because this is, this is a, a monumental event when in the course of human events, as the Declaration of Independence reads, is that, um, that uh, it's, it, it, there comes a time to kind of dissolve the bands of a, that a government holds over a people. And that uh, Jefferson, and you know, you know, I'm actually studying right now, a, I'm going through a course on the Constitution and uh, the Declaration and things like that. There's a lot of great resources online and so I thought, you know, I need to learn more about this stuff. And I've learned a lot just going through that course. If you're interested in it, ask me about it, and I'll share the information with you where you can get uh, some information about it. But, um, but for us as a people here in America, that, the, that July 4th is, is a, an important holiday. It's an important holiday for our country. But, and... And it's had an impact on all of our lives as a result. But it just pales in comparison to what Jesus did for us. 
some 2,000 years ago. And so the big question that we have to ask ourselves is that what impact does that event have on our lives and his meal in the presence of his disciples that uh, gives us some clue. Let's read that text as we find it in Luke chapter 24, verses 36 through 49. It says, well, they were still talking about this. Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, peace be with you. We're going to circle back to that in just a moment. But it's not just kind of a, like a throwaway term that like, in, hey, peace out, you know, type of thing. Is that, is that, uh, is that when, when he comes to them and he, and he announces peace be with you, that's very significant right there. But um, they were startled, you think? <laughs> you know, I mean, <laughs> really, they were startled and, that, uh, and frightened and thinking that they, they saw a ghost. And by the way, that's when people who, who um, object to the, um, the resurrection oftentimes will ex try to explain it away as a mere apparition. And there's a, good, a lot of good reasons why that doesn't hold true. But we see here in this text that Jesus is going to set their minds really at ease really quickly about, about um, the reality, his physicality there. And so that um, he says, uh, look at my hands. Or first of all, verse 38, he says, he said to them, uh, why are you troubled and why do doubts arise in your minds? Look at my hands and my feet. It is I myself. Touch, touch me and see. A ghost does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. And then when he had said this, he showed them his hands and feet. And while they still did not believe it because of joy and amazement, he asked them, do you have anything to eat? Now, that's going to set everything to rest, you know, because if a ghost eats a piece of food, it's just going to just drop right through, right? But, uh, and so they gave him a piece of broiled fish, fish, and he took it, ate it in their presence. You know what he said? Mm, I've had better. No, no. <laughs> That's not what he said. <laughs> but he, he ate the fish right there in their, their presence. He said to them, and this is what I told you while I was still Old Testament is divided into three parts. There's the law of Moses. There's the prophets and the Psalms. And so then he opened their minds so that they could understand the scriptures. He told them, this is what is written. The Messiah will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day and repentance for the forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations beginning at Jerusalem. You're witnesses of these things. He says, I'm going to send you what my father has promised, but stay in the city until I have been clothed, until you have been clothed with power from on high. You know, when we go back through and kind of like look at this, and that's one of the things that helps me a lot in my spiritual life, is that you read these things through. Well, I'll, I'll read them through. And, you know, and you know, you hear the, just the story, but then if you slow down, and that's really, there's a, there's a, a, um, a philosopher who's now dead, a Mortimer Adler, and he wrote a book. I, I think that he wrote a book, I can't remember if the, the title was either How to Read or How to Read Slowly. And that, um, and it is, um, and that's one of the things that we, we, we go through and re, we read the story but we don't really stop and pause and think about the implications. And that's what I want to do here with you today is unpack some of those implications. First of all, one of the very first things that we see in this story is that Christ's resurrection gives me peace. It says, while they were still standing and uh, still talking about this, Jesus stood among them and said, peace be with you. Think about your life. You know, even you know, with um, Janice and her circumstances with her mom in law, uh, life can be scary, right? You know, life can be scary. And 
that we can face circumstances that, um, that overwhelm us. And, uh, and we're going to face those circumstances one of two ways. We are either going to face those circumstances feeling overwhelmed and completely stressed out and, uh, and allow the fear to, um, to um, be the most significant thing. Or we can face those circumstances with uh, knowing that the risen Christ, because he lives, he's still, he's still here with me in this circumstance. He is still here with me when my loved one is sick. He is with me when I'm having problems in my family. He is with me when a loved one dies. He is with me when I've had a reversal of finances. It's because he lives. I can face tomorrow. And you know, there's an old song. Some of us remember that, that uh, been around the church for a while. It's because he lives. And it says, uh, the lyrics in it says, and because he lives, I can face tomorrow. And that's true regardless of, you know, those circumstances sometimes work out in a way that we want, correct? And sometimes the circumstances play out and they, um, they turn out in a way that we want. But sometimes those circumstances turn out in ways that we don't want. But because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Uh, because he lives, all, this, all fear is gone. Now, that doesn't mean you, that you're never going to f uh, feel afraid or concerned in times of stress or problems, because you will. But it's whether or not that fear is going to become your settled position in dealing with that. Or you see that um, a living Savior is bigger than my biggest problem right now. It says, um, because I know he holds the future, every one of your days, every one of your days that are going to unfold in your life. Some of you here are young, and, um, and we all have expectations and hopes of how our life is going to unfold. And then some of us have lived a lot of life already. That's a, that's a, a euphemism of saying you're old, you know? <laughs> But we've lived a lot of life already, and we realize that the story doesn't always unfold the way we want it to, right? But because I know he holds the future, and life is worth the living just because he lives. When Jesus arrives on the scene after his resurrection, and the disciples have gone through the most... Um, uh, the, uh, the most traumatic experience of their life. That, uh, and they're now just kind of coming out of that. The first thing that Jesus says to them is what? Peace be with you. Let's settle down and take a deep breath and peace be with you. Because he lives, I know I can face tomorrow. And this is how the resurrection impacts me. That, uh, and I've often said it before, for people who are going through life's difficult circumstances, I don't know how they do it, to tell you the truth. You know, because, because when you're going through life's difficult circumstances and everything's caving in on you, is that... Um, is that you're either going to just have to live with those fears and that, and that ugliness and that heartbreak, or you can know that um, because he lives, I can face tomorrow. That um, I can face every tomorrow in my life. And, and that's what the resurrection does for us, friends, here. Let's understand is that we're not just talking about some Bible stuff. We're talking about the way that reality is truly structured and that Jesus is resurrected from the dead and that I can face every tomorrow in my life. I can face every tomorrow in my life when my loved one dies. 
I can face every tomorrow of my life when I've had a reversal in, in finances. I can face every tomorrow of my life when I have personal health problems. I can face every tomorrow in my life because he lives. Peace be with you, Jesus says. We're told in Hebrews 13, 5, never will I leave you and never will I forsake you. Wouldn't it be wonderful that if in the midst of all of our, our trauma, we could, we could hold on to that truth, is that even in the chaos, is that Christ is here and that he's going to get me through this. In Matthew 28, 20, Jesus says, you know, just before his ascension, he says, and be sure of this, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. So it's not like um, this is a great truth that impacted that generation and now has faded uh, from memory. It's because he lives. I can face tomorrow. Here in the 21st century, it's because he lives. I can face tomorrow when I'm living in an uncertain political time. It's because he lives. I can face tomorrow. Uh, when I'm living in an uncertain economic time and when the uh, recession uh, deepens, it's because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Uh, when people talk about food supply and things of that nature, it's because he lives. I was just talking with Val here this morning and he was telling me he's stuck on watching YouTube here lately and he's been watching the various broadcasts about the, um, the drought that has impacted Lake Mead. And, and he was telling me, he's telling me all this new stuff he's learned about Lake Mead and Lake Powell and, and all of that. And how that the drought is impacting that. And, you know, Lake Powell uh, is uh, where the Hoover Dam is, right? Did I get that one right? Mead. Lake Mead. Yeah. Okay, Lake Mead. And Lake Mead supplies, which one supplies L.A.? Powell supplies Mead, Mead supplies Vegas. All right, so Mead supplies Vegas with their power, right? Yeah. And also much of L.A. with their power. And so... Um, and so as that water level goes down, is that that impacts the power grid. Oh, you know, it's frightening times, right, for people. But because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Is that, um, you know, uh, Christians, uh, I, I believe we need to be prepared people. I really do. I, I think that we need to think ahead and all. But we also need to be the type of people that have the confidence that God's going to get me through this. I don't know how, but he will. But I can face not only my tomorrows in this life, I can face my, tomorrow, my first tomorrow. Think about what that's going to be like. Because I've oftentimes played out that script in my own head, what my first tomorrow is going to be like when I stand before God. You know, I stand before God in judgment. I'll, I'll be glad. I'll be glad when it's that, that moment is behind me. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> that, uh, because then you're going to know one way, for, one way or the other. And that, uh, as the Apostle Paul tells us here in Philippians chapter 1, verse number 21, is that we can have the confidence where he says, for me to live is Christ and to die is what? Gain. Gain. You know, from our standpoint, it's, um, it's traumatic when a loved one dies from our standpoint. But when our um, loved one is, um, uh, knows the Lord, it's gain for them. Some of us have gone through that experience, right? Is that we've had loved ones who've died who've known the Lord. And uh, while our heart breaks over our loss, is that our loss is their gain. And never again will the ugliness and the trauma and the heartbreak and the, uh, the, um, the darkness of this life ever molest them again. They are now immune from that forever. And so um, it's because he lives, all fear is gone. 
Hebrews 13, 5, we read that a little bit earlier, but also verse 6, it says, Never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. So we can say with confidence, what? The Lord is my helper, I will not be afraid. Wouldn't that be a great mantra to adopt in every one of your circumstances that throw you, throws you off kilter in life is that never will I leave you, never will I forsake you, so I can say with confidence, the Lord is my helper, I will not be afraid. Is that I'm going to walk through this circumstance trusting that God is with me because he lives. I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, that a life is worth the living. You know, let's face it, is that we face things in life that, um, that erode our joy, right? And the Bible is very realistic about this. Even Jesus himself says in, in uh, John 16, 33, he says, in this world you will have trouble. But then, you know, that's sandwiched between two great promises. But take heart, I have overcome the world. But in, in me you will find peace. There, there's that, um, see, life is still worth the living. And uh, one of the things I've discovered about in my walk and relationship with God is that when he doesn't fix the circumstance that I'm facing, he's doing a work in me. And that work in me is to deepen my faith, to de deepen my confidence, to deepen my assurance, to know that uh, because he lives, face tomorrow, because he lives, all fear is gone. And because I know he holds the future, life is worth the living just because he lives. Philippians 1 and 21 through 25 says, For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. We read that already, but let's read on. And he says, if, I'm go, if I am to go on living in the body, this will mean fruitful labor for me. He says, you know, if I get the chance to keep on living, that that's an opportunity for, you to, for me to use my life for God's glory. That... Um, Yet what am I to choose? I don't know, Paul says. I'm torn between the two. I, des I desire to depart and be with Christ, which is far better by far, but it's more necessary for you that I remain in the body. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain and I will continue with you all for your progress and joy in the faith. So what Paul saw is that life was worth the living. Even though he was facing difficulty in life, at this time when he was writing this letter, he was in prison. And that, um, but he says, you know, I know that God has a purpose for me in this. It's because he lives, friends. That's what I'm talking about. That's what the resurrection does for us. You know, it's something that, it's something sh that should inform our every waking moment. You know, you've had a tough day. You've had a tough week whatever it is, is that we, should, we, we need to allow the truth of Jesus' resurrection to inform our every waking moment, and it's because he lives that we can have this confidence. You see, Christ's resurrection, when we read this text, we kind of see when we slow down and we read the text, we see what's going on here. And one of the things is that Jesus starts off by saying, hey, peace, guys, you know is that uh, you've been filled with anxiety, you've been filled with, you know, what is anxiety? Well, it's fear is what it is. It says, you've been filled with fear, peace, slow down a bit, take a breath, I'm here. And boy, wouldn't that make a difference in our lives? If we could just slow down a bit, take a breath and know that he's here. But Christ's resurrection also gives me assurance. Now notice is that they were startled and frightened they were startled and frightened, thinking that they saw a ghost. And he said to them, oh, why are you troubled? And, and why do doubts arise in your minds? Now think about that for a moment. Here they were, here, uh, um, they were with Jesus standing right before them, and still they had their doubts. And they still had their fears. You know, <laughs> it's a, uh, why, uh, why do doubts arise in your mind? What he's trying to do is he's trying to, he starts off with 
telling them, hey, peace, let's slow down, take a breath, I'm here. And then he moves into kind of giving them assurance and say, you don't need to doubt about this. And let me just show you why. I'm really here. It's not an apparition. It's not a ghost. Is that I'm really here. Is that, um, you see, one of the things that Christ's resurrection does for us is that it helps me to know that that, that truth is bigger than my doubts. Now, uh, there are a lot of Christians, there are a lot of preachers out there that want to make you feel guilty if you ever have any questions, or they want to make you feel bad if you ever have any doubts. And I've learned that, I've learned that that's just not the case, is that um, some people are kind of wired and they seem to be able to just kind of coast through life and they have all the faith that, you know, I, I, I wish that I could have. But then there are people like me who have doubts and who have questions and, and things like that. And I've gotten to the place in my life where I've quit uh, making apologies for that. And I've learned that doubts are not that, uh, they're not that scary. They're not that scary. You know why? Because the resurrection is bigger than my doubts. That there are certain truths that are bigger than my doubts. And even though I can't figure out everything, see, that's part of my problem is I want to figure out everything. Is that, is that um, there are truths that are just going to uh, present themselves to you and you're just going to have to accept. Now, uh, one of the things that I found, let me just give you a little bit of word of advice on somebody who's walked this path probably longer than some of you have with respect to this life of faith that is mixed with doubts. And what I found is that if you're like me in that regard, then make it your job uh, to get answers to whatever questions are holding you back. You know, uh, I, I, I'm, here's a little aside. And I've, I've learned this in dealing with people in my ministry, that um, uh, I, I've dealt with people along the way who have had kids who have had mental illness. And, you know, and, and that, that's traumatic for a parent to have a child who has mental illness. But, but then what I try to encourage that parent is that this is an opportunity for you to become the best expert that you can be in how to help somebody who has a problem like that. Now, that doesn't mean that you have to become, a, you know, a professional or a medical doctor or a psychiatrist or a counselor. But what it does mean is that your job now is to learn how to be the best parent possible with a kid with, let's say, ADHD or a kid with schizophrenia or a kid who is de developmentally disabled or a kid who has some uh, oppositional defiance disorder or any of that stuff that you see it's your turn now nobody volunteers to say hey I want to you know I want to walk this path but it's your turn now to learn all that you can about how to manage this in a healthy way and that's what I've learned about doubts see one of the things that doubts has really done for me and it, it hasn't you know, I don't have all the answers, but I, I have a whole lot more than I did before. But one of the things that doubts has done for me, it's helped me to be equipped to help other doubters because they're out there. And when people will say, well, how do you know that Jesus's resurrection really happened? Or how do you know that God exists? Or how do you know that the Bible is true? Or what makes you think that Christianity is better than Islam or whatever else is that you can have uh, some answers ready to go and share those with others. And so, what it is, it's, it's, it's bigger than my preconceptions. Let me unpack what I mean by that, because that's what we actually see in this text, is that, you know, they thought that they'd seen a ghost. Uh, why, why did they think that they saw a ghost? It's because this doesn't fit in the way that I think about the world, you know? 
This doesn't fit in the way that I think about the world. A resurrection doesn't match my bias. And that's the problem in our culture today. I'll tell you what the problem in our culture, we have been so indoctrinated, matter of fact, from the time you get into grade school on, you know, and that's, I would be, I would be a lot happier about the public school system if it wasn't an indoctrination platform, you know, where they taught you reading and writing and arithmetic instead of a, um, a way of thinking about, and it's becoming more and more a doctrination platform, it really is, is that, you know, it's, it's becoming a, 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 um, a place where young children are exposed to this wokeism and from a very early age, you know, uh, you know, when, uh, um, when somebody wants to talk to a, uh, a um, kindergartner about sexual matters that are just way, way beyond their developmental, uh, 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 you know, their thinking, that person is not an educator. That person's a predator. You know, that's what it is. You know, is that uh, some of that stuff, what's wrong? Tell me this, what's wrong with letting kids be innocent as long as they can? What's wrong with that? You know, we don't have to educate our kids, we, or excuse me, indoctrinate our kids with every woke idea that comes along. And that's kind of the direction that our schools are going. Well, you know, let me get off my soapbox. But let me tell you, is that that's exactly what has happened in our culture, is that we have, the people in our culture have a particular way of looking at things, and by and large, the people in our culture have been indoctrinated with what's called naturalism. So in other words, is that it's, it's thinking that nature is all that there is, and that there's, there's a material or scientific explanation for everything. Well, you know, I could give you a whole lot of reasons why that isn't the case, but that's not what this sermon is about. But these guys, these guys knew enough that, wait a minute, dead people don't come back to life. They, they don't come back to life. They're not, they, you know, not in the way that Jesus did. And so, um, you see, the Jews, they believed in the resurrection, but they didn't believe that one guy would come back for everybody else. And that's what we have with Christ. We read in the book of Daniel what the Jewish, uh, what the Jewish mind believed about resurrection. And in Daniel, 500 years before Jesus came on the scene, it says, multitudes who sleep in the dust of the earth will awake, some to everlasting life, others to shame and everlasting contempt. Those who are wise will shine like the brightness of the heavens, and those who lead many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. So the Jews believed in the resurrection at the end of time. But what they weren't prepared for was this special instance of one person, one person being resurrected before that end. But that's exactly what happened with Jesus. You see, Jesus is essentially, the Bible calls him the firstborn from among the dead. That's one of the titles that Jesus has in, because he's the one who shows us what's going to happen to us, is that you're going to be resurrected in, um, in a physical body. Now, it will be a glorified body, but it will be, it certainly will be better than the one you have right now. I'm just telling you, you know, <laughs> and better than the one I have. <laughs> But, but there's a one-to-one -one correspondence to this because, you know, the guy who went into the tomb, that body is the same body that came out of the tomb. You know, is, is the same Jesus Christ. And so he says in John 20, 29, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. You know who that's describing? That's describing you and me. You know, we believe in this, even though we haven't seen it. And so Christ's resurrection, we see in this passage of Scripture, is doing a number of things. Number one is that he comes and he, 
he gives us, he announces peace. He says, I'm here, my presence is bigger than your biggest problem. Secondly, he gives us assurance. Yeah, you have doubts and you don't understand why this is happening the way it is, but it's happening, friends. This really is happening. And then number three is that Christ's resurrection gives us purpose. And because he lives, right? That uh, I can face tomorrow, all fear is gone, and life is worth the living just because he lives. Uh, Luke 24, verse 48, gives us some of the reason that uh, life is worth the living. It says there that you are my witnesses of these things. And, and you know what that means is that I will embrace my calling as a witness to Christ. And it tells us in 1 Peter 5, uh, excuse me, 3 verses 15 and 16. And if someone asks you about the hope that you have as a believer, be ready to explain it, but do so, do this in, with gentleness and in a respectful way. See, my job, your job, is just to tell what you know. Has Jesus made a difference in your life? Uh, you know, I mean, seriously, has Jesus made a difference in your life? Your job is to tell what you know. Let me tell you about the difference that he's made for me, you know. You don't have to come up with answers that you don't have. Your job is just to, uh, to say what you know. That, um, and I'll not only uh, seek my, uh, to fulfill my calling, but I will seek his empowering, just like what we read in this passage of scripture. He says, I'm going to send you what my father has promised, but stay in the city until you have been clothed with power from on high. And what he's telling you is that you don't have to do your job in your own power, is that you have resources, and that resource is, is the Holy Spirit. I like what the uh, navigators say about witnessing, and they say this, witnessing is sharing Christ in the power of the Holy Spirit and leaving the results up to God. I always tell people, don't tug at green fruit. You know, some people just aren't ready. You keep on tugging and there's no point in tugging is that uh, when they're ready is that someone will come along and be able to reap that harvest. But in the meantime, don't tug at green fruit. But in the meantime, continue uh, to fulfill your calling. You see, here's the take home from this message is that Christ's resurrection changes life in big ways. It gives you peace, it gives you assurance, and it gives you a calling. And that's what it's done for me. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you for this truth of Christ's resurrection and help us to let that inform our daily living. Lord, as we go through this week, may we cling to um, this reality and regardless of the circumstances that we face and the disappointments that come our way and the trials and temptations that we have, is that may we know that um, because he lives, I can face tomorrow. We ask this in the name of our Lord and Savior, our only hope, Jesus Christ. And God's people said, Amen. Amen. So let me read a passage of scripture for communion here this morning. Uh, we take communion every week here at Compass. We invite you to celebrate with us, both here um, publicly or in person or online. And the scripture I'd like to read is found today in the book of Ephesians chapter 1, and it says this, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with... Now, I want you to listen carefully to this. He has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. So he's withheld nothing from you or me. Now, I know that life gets complicated, 
but when we walk in the spirit and not in the flesh, is that we find greater power and resources for living. We go on to read in this text that in him, talking about Jesus, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. So one of the great spiritual blessings that we have, because until the Lord comes and restores everything, we are still going to live with the consequences of the fall. And those consequences we carry in our spirits, we, they, it, it surfaces in our relationships and we have it in our bodies, is that, um, that we just have to deal with those realities. But there's a redemption that is brought about through the blood of Christ. And we just don't fully appreciate the level of that. But he goes on to, um, to offer up a prayer for the people. And maybe, and this could be my prayer for you today. He says, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people, and his incomparably great power for us who believe. That power is the same as the mighty strength he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms far above all rule and authority, power and a dominion and every name that is invoked, not only in this present age, but in the one to come. And God placed all things under his feet and appointed him to be the head over everything for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. Friends, that resurrection power is the power that is at work in your spirit right now. And one day you'll understand and I'll understand the full extent of uh, what that uh, power is like. But in the meantime, time, may the eyes of our heart uh, be opened. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you for um, your sacrifice on our behalf. Thank you for shedding your blood and carrying within yourself the penalty that we deserve for our sins. Forgive us for all the times we've gone our own way and we have uh, turned our backs on you. May we learn to walk in your spirit. May we learn to walk in faith. May we experience in more deeper way this resurrection power. We pray this in your name. Amen.
Well, thank you for your partnership in our ministry here at Compass. Um, and we appreciate each and every one of you who um, provide for our ministry, uh, not only through your prayer support, because we certainly need that, and, but also uh, through your giving. And it really makes a world of difference for us here. You can give in church, online. You can give at compasslive.org. You can give by text and by texting the word give to 833-545-4190. Or you can give by mail by mailing your check to P.O. Box 54 or 74, not 54 because I'd go to the wrong box. 74 at 53, Riverside, California, 92513. Hey, I want to just give a shout out uh, to uh, the folks that are watching here today. And, you know, we have different ones that uh, watch routinely and are our regulars. And so uh, Jan and Dave here locally in Riverside, we, um, we have uh, Nor and Rick and Steve who watch in, in um, um, Tacoma. We have um, uh, Bonnie who watches in Walla Walla. And we have others throughout the uh, country that are watching. And so I appreciate each one of you. I really do. It's, um, it, you know, it, it's what keeps me going in the ministry. And so, and I appreciate those folks that come here and join us live. And so thank you for being here with us today. It, it truly is, it's like it says, you're the best part of our ministry. And so I appreciate each one of you is that we have a song coming up. I was, telling, I was telling Kathleen earlier today is that one of the advantages of, of using recorded music before the service and afterwards is that we can bring in the best talent in the world. And so, and so Carrie Underwood is going to be leading us in our closing song this morning. <laughs> so, she showed up here at Compass. And so... You know, and like I said, I'd play that uh, live on Facebook, but they, they, uh, they just come, they come down on you hard. They really do. And so I, I want to keep the ministry open as long as we're able to do that. And so, but I think you'll enjoy this. Vince will put in the link to that song so that you can be blessed by it following the service itself. And so in the meantime, let me just offer up a, um, a blessing for you here this morning. And now, may the living Christ um, be with you as you face all the circumstances that you're going to face this week. And may you face those with peace. May you face those with um, assurance. And may you face that with a calling in your own life to be a witness to all that Christ has done, is doing, and will do for you. We pray this in his name. And God's people said, amen. Thanks again for watching. That's it for today. We'll see you next week.